So I want to welcome you all to the, the fourth annual Global Environmental Justice Conference um, in which we do something. And I, here I want to introduce uh, the person responsible uh, for kicking off environmental justice really at, at YSE, uh, Dean Burke. Uh, she often doesn't get credit for the transformative impact she's had on this school, and I wanted to make sure that you all appreciate that one of the reasons this is happening is because of her commitment to these issues. And so let me give you a little bit uh, more background on Dean Burke. She's uh, an ecosystem ecologist who focuses on carbon and nitrogen cycling in dry land uh, ecosystems. She came to us from uh, Montana, or Wyoming, excuse me, I, I don't know if people are sensitive about that stuff out west, but, but from, from Wyoming. Uh, and uh, she's been dean for seven years now. Uh, she's been my dean the, the whole time. She's been incredibly supportive of my work and the work of the center. So uh, with that, welcome Dean Burke. Thank you. Good morning and welcome, everybody. Uh, let's begin today by acknowledging with recognition and respect the people who for so long stewarded the land and water here. We're on lands that have long been cared for and called home by indigenous peoples and nations that include the Mohican, Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill, Pagusset, Neantic, and the Quinnipiac, along with other Algonquin-speaking people. These communities have been stewards of these beautiful lands and waters across countless generations, and it's in their honor that we express our gratitude and respect for the joy and nurturing that these lands and waters continue to offer us. The mission of our school here is to promote the sustainability of natural resources, and it's appropriate that we honor those who have stewarded these natural resources here for so long, as well as those across the globe for the millennia. And I want to welcome you to the fourth annual Global Environmental Justice Conference that's focused this year on a wonderful topic, environmental joy, and sponsored by the Yale Center for Environmental Justice, run by Professor Gerald Torres. Here at the Yale School of the Environment, we've woven environmental justice into the fabric of our mission, in our teaching, in our research, and in our everyday actions and conversations. <laughs> Through faculty such as Professors Gerald Torres, Dorsita Taylor, Michelle Bell, Amity Doolittle, Narsima Rao, and others, we've developed robust courses, fostered discussions, and explorations in realms that include public health and environmental justice, energy justice, indigenous knowledge, tribal co-management, and more, all of which contribute to a richer, more nuanced understanding of environmental justice. The Yale Center for Environmental Justice is at the heart of our community, and it's not just at the heart of our community here in the School of the Environment, it pulls together incredible minds from across Yale, including 35 faculty members and researchers committed to studying and advancing the cause of environmental justice across the university. We also owe a great deal of gratitude to those who have fueled our journey in this conference, particularly Graciela Chichelniski, whom we'll hear from momentarily for her unwavering support of this conference in honor of her daughter, Natasha Chichelniski Heal, who was a strong intellectual and advocate for global environmental justice. We're also grateful to USAID for their additional support the last two years, and the Equation Project for support of grassroots attendees. And let, then let's not forget the many institutes across Yale that contribute to this conference and the Yale Center for Environmental Justice. Uh, those include uh, the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, the Institute for Sacred Music, 
the African American Studies Department, the Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration, as well as the Yale Law School. Our conference and our work on environmental justice is focused on intellectual pursuits and action, and I think that's why we're all here today. We hope to alleviate suffering across the world associated with environmental injustices, and we hope to enhance well-being. This conference is a canvas of our collective wisdom and knowledge, raising the important questions and painting a path forwards toward a just and thriving planet and a joyful one. So thank you all for being here. Gerald, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Dean Burke. I'd like to introduce uh, the original patron of the, of the conference, Dr. Graciela Chichelnitsky, who is, uh, has been uh, a leader in fighting climate change in her research and in her work. I'm not going to read her entire bio. It's available in, uh, in the app. She's a, been a, a profound advocate and supporter of this project. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Graciela. I could have given it longer, but you know. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. The emphasis is on pleasure and joy this time, and I think for a good reason, although together with that come really the biggest challenges ever in this area. I prepared a 15-minute uh, presentation that you're going to see. I don't know how to move it forward hmm. or here. And I wanted to uh, tell you that it Indy Berg, Dean Berg, has been transformational for me, has been transformational for this activity here. And she says you're not supposed to influence faculty, and I know that. <laughs> but <laughs> her influence is enormous. Her intellectual influence is enormous and very much appreciated. In addition to that, there is a uh, uh, Gerald, Professor Gerald Torres, I am so happy to know him, even and hopefully to work with him even closer, much closer now, as well as with Michael Gelopter, who has been, you know, bringing me to, from from New York to here, and he has been in every way a great supporter. So thank you guys, and this is just some of them. So let me tell you very quickly that um, this is a very special moment for the topic of environmental justice because of legislation on this area that makes the US, believe it or not, the leader on environmental justice. It's incredible. I mean, you, we know that the US has not been at the forefront, to say the least, but the situation has changed. So let me tell you from the beginning and what we are hoping to do about it. So I call this a financial breakthrough for reversing climate change. The reversing climate change is for my last book. That's the title. And the financial breakthrough is because this is a market-oriented financial breakthrough as well as a breakthrough for um, environmental justice. So, first of all, you know, I'm going to be very quick, that oil companies are extracting more oil today, and they are realizing more profits than ever. And this is in a moment of, really, climate crisis, and we all recognize it now. For decades, scientists and engineers have found the technology that is the solution. That solution is to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. I have worked on that for many years. I even had a firm to do that, Global Thermostat, and I'm still working on it. But 
we know that the technology is ready now. The question is speed of implementation. And the speed is an issue because the United States National Academy of Sciences and the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have published report documenting that we need to remove 500 gigatons of CO2 in 10 to 20 years. And there is a way to visualize that in the form of billions of planes that have to be put next to each other in order to create the mass that is needed for the 500 gigatons of CO2 that I just mentioned. In 2019, which is when this event started, we had the le intellectual leadership and from the Yale faculty and uh, Dean um, Burke to focus on the issue of environmental justice. And at the same time that year, I was asked by uh, Senator Sorry, Senator um, Sheldon Whitehouse of um, Rhode Island to write a proposal for what legislation we needed to resolve this problem. On the basis of my patented technology that was at that point the you know, newest and the most successful for removing, uh, clim removing carbon from the atmosphere. Now it's more common. So March 2019, I wrote the proposal he wanted, and that proposal, together with another senator, became Barroso, became a bipartisan proposal to the Congress, and that proposal succeeded and created what's called 45Q, which is a legislation very advanced legislation by which the government offers carbon offers tax credits to those who remove CO2, not cash, tax credits. Since then, now we're talking about 2019 to now, it's four years, the IRA has emerged, and that called Inflation um, Reduction Act, for some reason, that legislation is what I want to tell you about, because that can transform everything, and it can lead us to what we're trying to do, and we should use it. Uh, we should do it. So this is the best legislation in the world, and we're saying that, knowing that the United States has always been a laggard in the international community on environmental issues. But there hasn't been enough financing so far because there is a $2 trillion gap, funding gap, for climate technologies. We know the technologies exist, we know what they are, but the speed needed is not there. The gap is, as I said, $2 trillion. Question, can the fantastic financial services industry in the United States help bridge this $2 trillion private funding gap for climate technologies. Can we make it happen? And I'm aware that many of us work in communities, and you are probably the most important of them all for the execution of what we're trying to do. So you stop me if I say something that is not totally clear, which happens. So can this happen? Can the financial services produce what's needed to bring in the two trillion dollars of private funding, which is there? There is a, there is a, a dry, uh, I don't want to use technical terms, but the, we know from the records that the, the money is there, that private investors globally want to invest in ESG, including uh, climate change policies. So what are we talking about? The laws are 45Q and IRA. I already talked about them. They are an incredible opportunity with the IRA 
that is being endowed with billions, and actually could be trillions, I will explain, and I can answer questions, and other f f federal investment. So right now, this exists. So there is a lot of opportunity for critical technology innovation. And in that, even though the situation is terrible, we can say there is joy in that progress. This is also a justice issue, and we need to empower communities to get this money and to become part of the change. This is very simple, money. The money can make this much faster and it can empower the communities to be part of the equation, the leading part, the moving part of the equation, as I just said. So the, you may say, but is that all we need? And the answer is no, not quite. We need a breakthrough that accompanies the legislation, IRA and 45Q. And it exists now. For the last few months, there is a newly patented asset-backed security, which is, if you think about it, like mortgage-backed securities, but it's not about mortgages. It's not, mortgages are about funding to build buildings. But in this case, the assets are not uh, the, the, uh, the money for building buildings, not mortgages. The assets are the money to pay for carbon removal, carbon removal plants. Not buildings, not mortgages, but so-called off-takes. Off-takes are what the government is now providing to bring in the money that can execute the carbon removal technology that our fantastic scientists have already created. I was one of them, so I know. So. Now, the question is, can we get the speed this way that we need? Because we're running out of time. And it's not, it's not just a word, it's real. So the answer is yes, and we need to talk about that. The breakthrough is asset-backed uh, securities, which are so popular because the borrowers that obtain money from this, pay 2% less in interest. So that makes them very popular. I mean, 2% of interest lower than what you get in another ways of borrowing money is huge. So uh, this is available from the US government. It's not just some uh, unusual scheme. It's the US government offering this. And the borrower pays, as I said, 2% lower interest rates, which is huge for anybody who wants to build a house. It's even bigger for anybody who needs to buy a carbon removal uh, firm or a carbon removal facility to remove carbon, which is what we need to do. So actually, financial services are in a privileged and powerful position right now. But they don't naturally do more than making money. They make money, that's for sure, a lot of money. But they don't naturally do what's right. They need help from the community. They need help from all of you. And that's what we're here to discuss, how to implement this with a speed that is needed to reverse what is already there, climate change. So I'm just going to stop here and I can answer questions, I suppose, at some point. And uh, if there is any, uh, anything else, any comments or any uh, disagreements or anything, I'm very happy to entertain and to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chitlinski. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Sarah Sladen, to, uh, who is the uh, Agency Youth Coordinator overseeing the advancement of USAID's policy for youth development, and its goal is to increase young people's access to and participation in the services, practices, and policies that will impact all of our, our lives. 
She brings more than uh, a decade. I think that's right. <laughs> more than 15 years right, of technical experience in international youth development, including promoting youth economic activities, coalition building and advocacy, peace building and conflict resolution. She joins USAID after serving as the technical advisor for youth engagement and before that as director of the Youth Economic Opportunities Network at Making Sense International. So Sarah Sladen. Thank you. Not as elegant as it should have been. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I am uh, honored to be here in your company at Yale Environmental Justice Conference on behalf of USAID, and we are so proud to co-sponsor this event for a second year. Um, I think many of you know, but I'll just share that the purpose of USAID is to lead the US government's international development and humanitarian efforts to save lives, to reduce poverty, strengthen democratic governance, and to help people progress beyond assistance. And to achieve this mission, we partner with a variety of institutions like Yale University, and including faith-based and community-based organizations, private companies, and other colleges and universities and non-governmental non organizations. And we also work in 90 countries around the world, so we have a global presence. The conference theme, Environmental Joy, asked us to reflect on the diverse ways that environmental justice helps us to alleviate suffering, increase well-being, and bring innovative solutions in the face of increasingly complex challenges. So first, let me share just some of the ways um, that environmental justice is showing up in an agency like USAID's priorities and how that's guiding our work. Because we work globally, we see the consequences of climate change and how they are felt locally and affect all of our work. It increases humanitarian needs, it threatens development progress, and it exacerbates global inequalities because we know that climate change affects us all, but we also know that it affects us unequally. Women, youth, indigenous peoples, and other social groups that are marginalized are disproportionately impacted by climate impacts. These same groups are often left out of decision-making, even though their knowledge and the skills and the work that they are already doing is critical to addressing the challenges that climate change creates. It's for this reason that USAID's climate strategy, which we published last year, includes equity and locally-led climate action as foundational principles. And it takes a whole of agency approach that will guide our work through 2030. It also commits us to do our part to advance climate justice by transforming our operations and strengthening diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in and for USAID's climate workforce. In other words, our agency recognizes that the transition to net zero and climate resilient economies will be most affected when we are guided by local priorities. And it's why our climate strategy commits us to increasing meaningful participation and active, inclusive, and local leadership in at least 40 partner countries where we work. But what does all of this look like in practice and how are we making progress? So I'm gonna offer just a few examples of this work in the 12 minutes that I have. Earlier this year, for example, USA launched the Generating Resilience and Opportunities for Women, or GROW initiative. The purpose of this initiative is to tackle urgent challenges that women are facing in food and water systems, while unlocking opportunities for women to advance economically. This initiative will invest up to $335 million to support women-led organizations and movements to respond to crises and to build resilient, inclusive economies, environments, and societies. Recognizing that indigenous peoples are leaders in sustainable environment preservation and natural resource management, USAID participates in the Forest Tenure Funders Group. This is a coalition of 23 countries and donor organizations, and collectively we have pledged $1.7 billion to advance indigenous peoples and local communities, tenure rights, and forest guardianship between 2021 and 2025. USAID has so far contributed to this goal by standing up more than 30 programs in the initiative's first year. And we're working to document and strengthen communities' forest rights, livelihoods, and resource management across the globe. You heard about climate finance this morning, some incredibly compelling uh, information and statistics. USAID has also set an ambitious target to mobilize $150 billion by 2030 for climate adaptation and mitigation in line with our partners' priorities. And this is because we recognize that globally access to climate finance remains unbalanced. 
For example, most climate finance to date has been gender neutral, with only 1% of all finance integrating a gender lens. This means that women and girls who are disproportionately affected by climate shocks cannot access financial resources. This is important because women also help develop sustainable solutions and need this access to finance. One of the examples of the ways that USAID is responding to this is that we've partnered with Amazon, Visa Foundation, and Reckitt to establish what we call the, gender, the Climate Gender Equity Fund, which aims to mobilize $60 million to support the scaling up of gender equitable climate mitigation and adaptation solutions. And the fund will directly support women-led and women-benefiting businesses and investment vehicles. So these are just some of the ways that we're trying to advance our climate strategy. But our strategy is supported by other agency-wide priorities and other policies that are also focused on achieving progress for equity and locally-led solutions. One of these is our agency-wide localization vision, in which we have redoubled our commitment to shift more leadership for development and humanitarian assistance to local actors. And to do this, we've set two interconnected agency targets to help us get, it, get there. The first target is that USAID will channel 25% of our funds directly to local partners by 2025. And the second is that by 2030, at least half of our programs will place local communities in the lead to set priorities, design projects, drive implementation, and define and measure results. This is fundamentally changing how development has traditionally been done. Similarly, launched last year, our local capacity strengthening, strengthening policy commits USAID to collaborate with local actors to define their own to define their own vision of success. And importantly, in the development of this policy, through that process, it provided an opportunity for those of us who work at USA to re-examine our approach to local capacity and reflect on how we can be more effective, more inclusive, and a more equitable partner. We're also finalizing a policy right now on locally-led humanitarian assistance. This is really focused on transforming how the humanitarian system operates um, reshifting a focus on local decisions and priorities. And as an example, USAID has partnered with a global network of more than 1,400 local civil society organizations for disaster reduction. In one of our projects in Honduras, this network works with 15 communities to ensure that development and humanitarian assistance is truly guided by the perspectives of the people most at risk. In my own role as agency youth coordinator, I know the policy was mentioned just now, that policy is focusing on expanding our support for building the capacity, the opportunity, and the resources for youth-led and youth-serving organizations to advance climate action globally. Just one example from Cambodia, USAID's Green Future activity has catalyzed a dynamic youth movement around the country focused on combating climate change and protecting natural resources. We have engaged high school students to be peer educators and mobilize support for behavior change around climate. So I know I have committed the cardinal sin of rattling off a list of programs and policies and examples from government, um, and I know this can feel somewhat dry and maybe a little bit obscure, but it's important because these examples of our commitments and our strategies reflect values, and they relate to environmental justice. At an agency like ours, and one that works at the scale that we do, these commitments and strategies offer important vision they translate into programming priorities, and they direct resource flows. And they are also a tool for accountability, both for USAID staff and the partners and communities in which we work. So if you'd like to learn more, if you want to go deeper than what I've been able to offer in the time this morning that we have, some of my colleagues are here from Washington, DC, as well as as far away as Jordan. And I really encourage you to talk to them more about the work that they're doing on the ground. Let me close with some reflections on the topic of joy, um, since I think that was the original ask. And just to say that I joined the US government about 10 months ago. And while I'm so proud to be part of USAID at a moment when we are focused on achieving progress for equity and locally led solutions, I can tell you as a government employee that the word joy, the concept of joy, doesn't come up very often. <laughs> but maybe it should. Maybe it should, because perhaps embracing the idea of joy in this work, especially when the work is its most difficult and frustrating and even heartbreaking, is a kind of act of resistance. It is to resist against despair and inaction and cynicism and maybe even bureaucracy. We'll see. When we prioritize these issues, when we think about joy in our policies, in our strategies, when we set about doing the hard work that we need to do to bring these efforts to life, 
the collective results can be profound. And in my role, I see the ways that they are reflected in the lives of young people. For me, embracing joy is to honor young people who have the right to a healthy climate and who continue to demand better from those of us in leadership and decision-making roles. And I think about the conversations I've had with young people about climate. In the Eastern and Southern Caribbean, in Colombia, in Ghana, in Egypt, in Northern Ireland, and on Wednesday at Career High School here in New Haven. And what I hear from young people is, yes, climate anxiety. They're thinking about that. But more so what I really hear and what I see is action, the need for more and in ways that are inclusive and just. The young people that I speak with understand that climate is connected to global health, to gender equality, to food security, and social justice, that climate is a human right, and they know that because they live it. I saw this during my visit to Career High School. It is a place um, that really demonstrated how caring adults and educators can create an environment of trust and psychological safety for their students in ways that enable them to pursue their curiosity and take risks and ask hard questions. Some of these students are actually here in this room. I think Bahati is here as well. She's a young woman I met yesterday who decided that she wanted to know how her peers feel about the environment in their neighborhoods and what kinds of climate solutions they feel are needed. And so to do this of her own volition, Bahati designed and implemented an online survey. And she recruited a group of like-minded students also interested in the environment to speak to an auditorium of their peers and some government strangers about what they learned from the survey and what environmental justice means to them. And these students spoke about deforestation, biodiversity, redlining, social justice, and the need for more equitable and inclusive climate solutions. All this is to say, when we create an enabling environment for young people to use their voices, that is transformative systems change. And for me, an example of environmental joy in this work. And it is happening just down the road from this campus. In closing, I just want to say again how honored I am to have been invited to share with you some of the ways that we're working at USA to support and partner with communities to develop innovative solutions to address climate crisis. And I'm grateful to be part of a conversation and a community that is so focused on environmental justice and most importantly, on joy. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, next introduce uh, Nayeli Kobo, who is was the nine, uh, 2022 Goldman Prize winner. And for those of you who don't know what the Goldman Prize is, it's it's like the Environmental Nobel Prize. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big deal. Okay, it's a big deal. Uh, and so I'm r really grateful that you're uh, joining us today. She, uh, you know, didn't get that prize just for nothing. Right. She got that prize because she uh, led a, a grassroots uh, uh, campaign that ultimately led to the uh, permanently shutting down of oil exploration uh, and toxic drilling in uh, urban areas in LA, uh, got the city council to pass uh, an ordinance, got the California legislature to pass a statute and is currently, if I'm, I'm going to project this, I don't know this for sure, so you'll have to tell me whether it's true or not, right, is also defending those efforts against uh, efforts to undo them. Uh, and so we maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So the, as I said, the bios are available, so I'm not going to give it a, a long introduction. But we're really grateful that you're here with us today. everyone. How are we doing? Uh, I'll take it. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Extra excited because Yale is actually my dream school and I haven't been here since I took a tour when I was in high school. So it feels really full circle to be back here as a speaker today. I believe storytelling is a very compelling form of activism that oftentimes goes unnoticed. 
So I'm going to be sharing my story with you all today. Before I do that, I like to start my talks with something a little bit interactive. I'm going to ask you guys a question, and I literally want you guys to yell your answer to me. And please be quick, because I am on a time clock. What do you think belongs in a community? Love, people, parks, peace, trees, cooperation, balance. I love this. Notice how not a single person said an oil well. The reality is that there are 18 million Americans living a, cor living a mile or less to an active oil and gas well. The city of Los Angeles is the largest urban oil field in the nation, with over 580,000 Angelinos living a quarter of a mile or less to an active oil and gas well. I grew up 30 feet from one. I grew up in South Los Angeles in the most beautiful community I can think of. It was a space where if my mom and I were walking home after school and we saw the ice cream man and we didn't have cash, we could still get the popsicle and we could pay him next time. Or if my mom was making breakfast and she realized she didn't have cheese for the omelet, our neighbor would give us cheese and tomatoes and spinach to really jazz it up. We were all family. And I grew up, as I mentioned, 30 feet from an active oil and gas well. When drilling for oil, there are many toxic emissions that are released into the air that are harmful to one's health, our safety, and our environment. In my personal experience, at the age of nine, I started getting really sick. It all started with a nosebleed. We didn't think much of it. It was probably too hot outside. I didn't drink enough water until the nosebleed came back three times that week, each time stronger than the last. It got to the point where my nosebleeds became so severe, I could no longer sleep in my own bed. I would have to sleep in a chair to prevent choking on my own blood at night. I developed heart palpitations and I used a heart monitor for several weeks. Body spasms so severe, I couldn't walk. My mom would have to carry me from one place to the other. Headaches, stomach pains. I developed asthma, which is something I'm always gonna have to live with now. My mom developed asthma at 40 and my grandma at 70, which is unheard of. This is what we're fighting against. We're fighting to protect our health. We're fighting to open the windows in our own homes, which is a basic right. The oil well in my community operates on land that is leased to them by the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. So as a community, we are fighting three monsters, the oil industry, the broken regulatory system people of color constantly fight, and the Archdiocese without attacking the faith. I really like to make that point clear. And I say we fight the archdiocese because I went to Catholic school my entire life. First grade through senior year of high school, it's because of the beliefs and morals that they have instilled in me that I feel like it is my job to call them out on being hypocrites. Because this is unfortunately another way that the church is abusing children. This oil well in my community has 21 underground wells. They operate with nine surrounding schools in the area. They share a wall with a high school for children with disabilities, such as paraplegia. And they share another wall with a daycare center for newborns to two-year-olds. And it's 30 feet from a senior living facility. Something oftentimes people don't know about these oil wells is that they operate under such immense pressure. Valves have to be manually opened every 10 to 15 minutes to prevent an explosion. We're living on a bomb. And there's oftentimes no evacu emergency evacuation plan in place for the surrounding community. I remember when I was in school around the age of 10, I would check the clock every 10 to 15 minutes and whisper to myself, I hope they open the valves. Eventually, as my school day progressed and I got distracted with quizzes, recess, kickball, at the end of the day at 3 p.m., I would whisper to myself, while I forgot about the valves, I'm glad my worker didn't. And that worker allowed me to live another day. I remember when I got my first MRI. It's weird to say my first. But I was 11 years old, and the doctor had mentioned, this machine is going to take a picture of your brain. Simple, right? Not to me. The way I thought of it was that they would see bubbles of my thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, I, oh my God, 
now, even to this day, I'm obsessed with Justin Bieber. So <laughs> I, I had to tell myself when I was getting my MRI done, not yet, you can't think of Justin Bieber serenading you. <laughs> you have to think of your pain. You have to think of the smells. So then those bubbles of the pain or the bubbles of the smells would pop up on the scan so the doctors could better know how to diagnose me. Once they showed me the image, I was like, damn, I missed 40 minutes of thinking of Justin Bieber, but <laughs> you win some, you lose some. I'm a very, very proud daughter of two immigrants. My mom immigrated here from Mexico, who's here today. Hi, mom. And my dad, who immigrated from Colombia. Many immigrant parents come to this country to give us a life they could only dream of. And I can only imagine the frustration so many parents felt when their children were being poisoned in their own homes, and that was out of their control. So what do you do when your community is under attack? You stand up and you fight back. So that's exactly what we did. We started organizing ourselves as a community. We started going door to door knocking, organizing town hall meetings, setting up phone banking. We started leading change. I co-founded with my mom, People Not Bolsos, which is People Not Oil Wells, which is a grassroots campaign in my community that tirelessly fights to shut down the well in my community. After four years of what felt like advocating in silence, we were very fortunate to capture the attention of the LA Times. They wrote a story about my community which captured the attention of former US Senator Barbara Boxer. She came to my community and had a press conference where she pleaded the oil well to cease operations. She also had US EPA of, of officials go inside of the well to conduct an investigation. After five minutes of being inside of the well, the officials had to leave because they all got sick. Five minutes. Imagine the lasting impacts that the surrounding community and the workers have from being constantly exposed. I'm very, very proud to say that the oil well in my commun community as of March 2020 is permanently closed. And, yeah. <laughs> the cherry on top is that the oil executives of that oil well are also facing over 20 criminal charges for violation of local and state laws. Shortly after, we realized that we were not the only community being affected by urban oil extraction and environmental racism. So we realized it was such a big issue citywide. So Stand Together Against Neighborhood Drilling Los Angeles was born. And it's a tireless coalition that fights to phase out all oil and gas wells in the city and county of Los Angeles, which was made last year in 2022 with a unanimous vote from the Los Angeles City Council and County Board of Supervisors. So over 20 years, which we are working down to get lowered, but throughout the next 20 years, I will be able to say Los Angeles was the largest urban oil field in the nation, and that's historic. In 2015, at the age of 14, I co-founded the South Central Youth Leadership Coalition, together with Youth for Environmental Justice and Centers for Communities for Better Environment. We successfully sued the City of Los Angeles for rubber stamping, environmental racism, and violation of CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. Because of that lawsuit, there is a new application itself when looking to expand or drill, and a memorandum. That lawsuit was powerful because we were only 14 to 17 years old, standing on our city hall steps, demanding our city listen to us and give us a livable future to inherit. When the zoning code that addresses oil exploration was developed, it was in the 1960s. Seatbelt laws had yet to be implemented and smoking on planes was still allowed. Yet we have yet to change our landmark, our Oh my gosh, our nation's landmark environmental laws. That was a tongue twister. Let's fast forward to 2020, a year that was difficult for everyone. On the, on the day, January 15th of 2020, I heard the words, nobody ever wants to hear. You have cancer. I was diagnosed at the age of 19 with stage two reproductive cancer. 
Before I share about my cancer diagnosis, I want to talk about the five years leading up to it. For five years, I was misdiagnosed. I had been searching for medical treatment, yet I was silenced, ignored, gaslighted. I was told the odds of you having something are one in a million. My medical case turned out to be one in a billion. Just like I had my childhood robbed of me, I lost my future. I lost the ability to become pregnant. I lost the ability to tell my future husband in an overly dramatic way we're pregnant. I lost the ability of feeling my first kick, all before I could make those decisions for myself. I can't help but think if one doctor had properly listened to me or examined me, those decisions could still be mine to make. My treatment consisted of three surgeries, six weeks of radiation, three rounds of chemo, eight minor procedures, and fighting off two infections before I heard the words, you are cancer-free, and now I'm two years in remission. I now have a new normal. I have a new quality of life. I'm now disabled, chronically ill. I live in constant chronic pain, but I'm here. And as long as I am here, I'm going to continue to share my story truthfully and unapologetically. I may not know all the science or all the legal terms, but I know my story, and that is what I'm always going to share. Last year, California signed and implemented into law a 3,200-foot health and safety buffer zone between oil extraction and sensitive land. Days later, the oil industry spent $20 million on an oil referendum to overturn this. They are willing to spend $100 million. This is where all of you come in. Raise your hand if you're from California. Yeah. Raise your hand if you know someone in California. Yeah. SB 1137 is currently under threat. This will protect millions of lives and we have the obligation to defend it. We have the obligation to canvas, to talk about SB 1137, to vote, to phone bank, to hold elected officials accountable, to fundraise, to post on social media. We all have a role to play when it comes to defending SB 1137, whether we're in the state of California, whether we vote or not. Something my mom always says is that this puzzle, this movement is a puzzle. Everyone has a unique shape, and this puzzle is incomplete without you. No one else fits your shape, and that's why you are so monumental to this cause. This started because of a small community that was deemed viewed, historically viewed as invisible, disposable, and silent, that said enough is enough, that led to shutting down the largest urban oil fields in the nation. My question to you all is, are you going to raise your fists in the air and stand up to demand climate action and environmental justice, or are you going to wait until your life is the one on the line? Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. It's um, for those of you from California. It's uh, the the uh, the effort. You know what the, you know the effort it takes. You know the challenges that continue to uh, to face it. Um, I guess without telling stories out of school, we're working to defend the uh, uh, this ordinance, which is currently being. Um, being uh, attacked by the people who, uh, by the oil companies, this might as well just say it, uh, by the oil companies. So we'll prevail. I'm not worried about that. Uh, in any event, I think before we get started, I want to say a, a couple of things uh, about joy. Uh, and we, uh, you know, from Ukraine to Palestine to Israel, there are a lot of difficult things happening in the world right now. And so 
What does all that mean for a conference that has as its center organizing principle the idea of joy? As Ross Gay said in his recent book, Inciting Joy, joy is not the opposite of sorrow. Joy is not the opposite of tragedy. What joy is, is taking agency and using that agency to produce the future you want. Right? And that's what the conference is about. It's about recognizing the agency that we all have, the need to build the space for change, the need to remember that the future we want, as was just illustrated by the last story, right, is in our hands. But it's not going to be done right, if we accept defeat or think we can't make the change. Right? We've got to embrace the love that is at the heart of the environmental movement and say that's what's going to produce the change that we want. And all of the change is sitting here. All of the change is sitting here. Right? So take what's at the root of it, the capacity to pr produce a joyous world. Imagine that that's what's got to inform the world that you want to produce and let's go forward. I want to introduce Michael Golubter, the executive director of the environmental, Yale Center on Environmental Justice. He's going to array, tell you what is going to happen next. Okay, so thank you all. Okay.